afternoon and welcome to the Church of Christ that meets in McEwen. Tonight you have got a gospel sermon that has been prepared for you. A gospel sermon. Completely gospel sermon tonight. But before we get started tonight, let's have a bit of an introduction. My name is Carter Buckner and there is, you can find me in one of two places most of the time. And one of those places is on YouTube. You just go to YouTube and type in Churches of Christ. C-H-U-R-C-H-S. Just S and no spaces. Or you can go to the Bold Springs Church of Christ every third Sunday of every month. Uh, and I'm usually out there at that time. Speaking of the Bold Springs Church of Christ, I was out there a couple of a um, couple months ago and there was a man who came and I didn't know who he was so I asked him I said excuse me sir what's your name and he said it's more so we went on with the service and we got started we sang a song we uh, prayed and I preached and we partook of the Lord's Supper and we had a closing prayer and we let out and that same man was walking back through the line on the way out and I just couldn't remember his name so I said excuse me sir I'm so sorry I forgot your name he said, it's still more. And I was like, well, it's good to have you here today, Mr. Stillmore. <laughs> Tonight's sermon talk, what we're going to be talking about tonight is what is ministry work? You know, there is nothing finer and nothing more fun, nothing more exciting than for Christians to be involved in ministry work. Now, if there was one verse that I would just like to put up on a big billboard tonight to just advertise this verse more than any other verse, verse really that we're going to be talking about tonight it's the base verse and that is first Peter chapter 4 and verse 10 it says that as each one hath received a special gift employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God now the definition of manifold is the coming together of multiple inputs and outputs and in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 5, it tells us how we are to do that. It says, but you should keep a clear mind in every situation, and don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. It tells us to work at telling others the good news, and to fully carry out the ministry which God has given to you. God equals qualified. In Revelation verses, chapter 3 and verses 15 through 16, God says, I know all the things that you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were either one or the other. But in, since you are neither hot nor cold, you are lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. What that's telling us is that we need to be on fire for the Lord. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21, it says, Jesus says that not everyone that saith, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And we should all take Paul's advice to Timothy when he says, Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. 1 Timothy 4.12 Now, before we can really get into talking about ministry tonight, we first have to start off with some of the pains that come along with ministry. And of course, anyone that does ministry correctly is going to experience some type of pain. But when we experience these pain, pains, we have got to install Matthew chapter 13 and verse 28 in our brains. Whenever something bad happens, we should immediately think of it. And it says, the Lord said that an enemy has done this. When bad things happen, an enemy has done this. In Matthew chapter 5 and verses 10 through 12, it says, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sakes, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. And then it tells us to rejoice and to be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. 
For so they persecuted the prophets that were before you. In Romans chapter 12 and verses 18 through 21, it says, If possible, so far as it depends upon you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, Ven never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals of fire upon his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Ministry. In Matthew chapter 6 and verses 14 through 15, it says that if you forgive men of their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you of your trespasses. But if you do not forgive men of their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you of your trespasses. Now we can talk about some of the joys that come out of doing ministry work. If we look at Matthew chapter 6 and verses 19 through 21, it says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes, nor where thieves break in and steal. And then it says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 1, it says that a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, and favor is better than silver or gold. It's been said, and it only makes sense, that if we expire when we die, we should inspire while we live. Something about ministry work that we have absolutely got to take note of, absolutely required when it comes to ministry work, is Luke chapter 14 and verse 27 through 30. It says, Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost? Count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and was not able to finish, everyone will begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build, but was not able to finish. If we look at John chapter 21, verses 15 through 20, it, it, um, th they've got to remember that this is after that miraculous fish catch, Jesus had already been crucified, he'd been resurrected, and he's coming back to Peter, and this is during, after the biggest fish catch that they had probably ever seen in their entire career, or probably ever will see. It's that miraculous fish, cake, fish catch. And, it's, and in verse 15 it says, When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Now hang on for just a second. Let's stop right there. Let's think about this. I can just see Jesus saying that. And I can just see him gesturing towards something when he says, do you love me more than these? The question is, what did he make a gesture toward? Did he make a gesture toward the bundles of fish and all the boats that they had for fishing? Peter, do you love me more than all of this? Or... Did he make a gesture toward the other apostles? Peter, do you love me more than these? Or did he make a gesture toward the environment, the mountains, the lake, everything in the background, and say, Peter, do you love me more than all of this? The point is that it doesn't matter at all what he was pointing to. The point is, the point that Jesus was trying to make here was that, do you love me more than blank. You fill in the blank. What? It's your job to fill in the blank. And then it says, he said unto him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said unto him, Feed 
my lambs. The definition of feed in theater is to deliver a line or cue to another performer. In other words, to provide assistance. And the baseball definition of feed is to pass the ball to a fellow teammate. In other words, work together. And the electrical definition of feed is to supply power to, or an electrical signal to a system, component, or station. In other words, to encourage one another. And then he said in verse 16, a second time he said unto him, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said unto him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said unto him, tend my sheep. The definition of tend is to be in the habit of doing something. To do or to provide the things necessary that a person needs for health, comfort, and welfare. To give attention to a particular person or task. Tend my sheep. And in verse 17, he said unto him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And Peter was grieved because he said unto him a third time, Peter, do you love me? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. Remember the basic things that we went over. Feed, to provide assistance, to work together, and to encourage one another. If we look at Matthew chapter 25 and verses 14 to 31, we can find the story of the wicked servant. And remember this story, it's where one of the servants had doubled what his master had given him, the other one had increased it, and the other one had did nothing with it. What can we learn from that story? Is that when God gives us something, he expects us to use it. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7, it asks us the question, what do you have that you did not receive? And as Christians, we are to serve Christ, so we must be profitable servants to him by using what he has given us to glorify him. And we mustn't sit idle. We must stay busy in the work of the Lord. You ask anyone who is successful in doing anything, and they will tell you this, that there is the right thing to do, and there is the wrong thing to do. But the worst thing that you can possibly do is to do nothing at all. And there's an old saying that says, whoever the devil finds idle, he will employ. The point is that the more God gives you, the more God expects out of you. We just need to be looking for opportunities to serve God in the things that we enjoy doing and or in the things that we already have. And just remember that kindness is not a thought, it's an action. Now, as we're talking about ministry work tonight, I figured I'd give you a few examples of some ministry works. And here they are. If you like to fish out on a lake in a fishing boat, did you know that you can actually use that to bring people to Christ? Let me give you, let me, let me explain that. Once there was a man who enjoyed fishing. He owned a, a boat and around 600 acres of land. So he invited 10 older members from church and two younger members that had not yet been baptized yet to go fishing with them. The first time they went out fishing, the two younger men who were not baptized enjoyed it so much that the next time they went out to go fishing, they asked if they could go too. So they went a second time. And that time, the two non-Christians decided to be baptized. And they grew to become very faithful Christians. It can be that simple. Here's another example. Once there was an old retired woman who was very skilled at cooking sourdough bread. She cooked around six loaves of sourdough bread a week. You see, the reason why she cooked the sour loaves of sourdough bread was so that she could use it as an excuse to visit people. She said that when she brought the sourdough bread to someone's house, that it didn't matter that, I mean, that she was always welcomed, and it didn't matter if they were her enemy or if they were their friends, if she knew them or not, or if they were much younger than she was, or even if they were older than she was. She said that she was always very welcomed and that the recipient was always very open to any conversation that she might want to bring up. The point is that you have a talent. Yes, you have a talent. 
that you can use. And you just need to find out what it is and how you can use it, harness it, to glorify God. Why else do you have it? Here's one more example. And this one's my favorite. Two summers ago, I went on a road trip with David Shannon. And while we were on that road trip, we visited a place called Rainbow Omega in Alabama. Rainbow Omega is a community for mentally retarded adults. And one of the residents there worked for the trash pickup. This man put tracks on garbage cans. Now, if you don't know what a track is, it's, it's like a tourist brochure that you would find at a hotel while on vacation. Uh, it's a small piece of paper. It has, usually has a picture on it, and it, has, and it has basically what we believe and why we believe what we believe inside of it. If you go out in the lobby on your way out by the water fountain, you'll find a, a wall, and they'll be all over it. But anyway, this man put tracks, mentally retarded man, put tracks on the garbage cans. And he told the residents that if they needed any help understanding the material, that he could not help them. But he did tell them that if they needed any help understanding the material, that he could find someone that could help them. And over the course of just one year, this so-called mentally retarded man had converted 63 people to Christ. 63 people in just one year. As every man hath received a gift, even so minister the same to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 10. You see, everyone has a job that you must do so do it. Everyone has a job that we must do. And everyone has a talent that you can use. And you must use it if you're going to glorify God and to please God the way you're supposed to be. You see, almost anything can be used for ministry work. Anything from a three-ring binder to your Facebook page to email to maybe just even just raw talent. Did you know that Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 2 says that do not forget to entertain strangers for by doing so some have even entertained angels without even knowing it. Also in ministry work we have to understand that time and concern are far more important and far and are absolutely required to be successful in doing it. Money is not necessarily required in order to be successful in ministry at all. And remember this, that if it's your idea, if you come up with it, then it's your responsibility to make it happen. Nobody's going to do it for you. Let's look at Nehemiah. Didn't Nehemiah say, hey, somebody needs to rebuild the wall? No, 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 no. Nehemiah, let's keep in mind that Nehemiah was a cupbearer. He probably didn't know anything about building walls. But Nehemiah knew that that wall needed to be rebuilt. So what did he do? He said, I'll make it my own personal responsibility to make, see to it that that wall gets built. And I'm not going to stop until it's built. And he built that wall. He didn't say somebody needs to rebuild the wall. He said, I'll do it. Now, this next part is for people who are already involved in ministry work. And for the people who are just now getting into it, keep it as a warning. Let's... Take the ministry lesson that we can learn from the seven churches of Asia. Let's go to Revelation chapter 2 and verse, verses 2 through 7. This is when the angel of the Lord is speaking to the seven churches of Asia. 
He says that I know your works and your labor and your patience and I know and how you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have exposed those pretending to be apostles and are not. And you have found them liars. And you have persevered and had patience for my name's sake. You have, you have labored and not fainted. And then he says, But this I have against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the first works or else, and here's the threat, I will come to you quickly and remove you from your lamps and remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. But you have this, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolonians, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the churches says, what the Spirit says to the churches, to him who overcomes. I will give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So what was he telling them here? He's basically saying, I know your works. In other words, I know your ministries. And I know the labor that you've been putting into them, the hard man hours that you've been putting into them. And I know your strong endurance, which you've had doing them day in and day out. Basically, he's saying, you're doing a great job. But you've lost your first love. He is begging them to come back to the right motive. They've lost their first love. Let's go back to the book of Ephesians and look at the church in Ephesus. Remember they were so on fire for the Lord that they went out and burned all the books on witchcraft. And here we are, reading them. And some of us have read all of them for pleasure. You see, it all comes back to counting the cost. Do you love me more than these? Whose music are you going to have to stop listening to? What TV shows are you going to have to stop watching? What video games are you going to have to stop playing? Because of the content contained in them. Now let's take it one step further, shall we? How many friends is this going to cost you? What are you going to have to give up in order to minister unto someone? How about your family? How are they going to take this? How are they going to react to it? How is it going to affect them? Do you love me more than these? It's time we count the cost. It's those little things that drive God crazy. Adam and Eve took a bite out of a piece of fruit. And look what happened. Uzzah touched an ark. And look what happened to him. He struck down. We harp on the rich young ruler because he turned his back and walked away on God. Just because he wouldn't give up his money. What about us? Are we similar? Some of us need to go home tonight and do a complete rethink on our Facebook page, especially under the Info tab. Who do you have listed as your favorite musician? Who do you have listed as your favorite television show? I think sometimes God sees these things as a form of idolatry. In Mark chapter 12, in verse 30, it says that you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. The point is, the point from the seven churches of Asia, the point from that is that it is impossible for us to, that it is pos that it is possible for us to become so involved and so busy in ministry work that you can actually lose your love for God in the process. And that great love can die even in the midst of ministry. Whatever you do, whether it be 
teach a Bible class or the next time that you post something on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube. Maybe the next time you deliver a meal or the next time that you talk to or entertain strangers. Do it because you love God. That is the right motive here. That's what was wrong with the seven churches of Asia. They didn't have the right motive. Remember, Jesus repeatedly said, He who has an ear, let him hear what the, churches, what the Spirit says to the churches. In other words, what the Bible says. In Matthew chapter 15 and verses 8 through 7, Jesus also said that these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. And, and he called the people unto him and he said, hear and understand. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verses 16 through 17, it says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. And in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, it says to study to show thyself approved unto God. And in Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6, it says that my, he says that my people are destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also reject you as my priest. Because you have ignored the law of your God, I will also ignore your children. You see, the lesson for us is that it is impossible to conduct, to conduct a successful ministry work in the name of the Lord without first hearing the word of God regularly. You see, people who don't study the Word of God are like a locomotive being opened up at 70 miles an hour and then removing the tracks. In John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus says that, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, it says, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So what was it meaning? Basically, it's saying if you do it right, if you do the ministry works right, the way I tell you to do it, you do it with the right motive, and you make it all the way up to the gates of hell, that they won't be able to stop you. Time to ask the, the most important question. And that is, are you ready to obey the gospel tonight? If so, the Bible tells us that to do that, you must believe with all of your heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. You must then repent of your sins and turn completely away from them. And you must be willing to confess with your mouth your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord. And you must be baptized into water so that your sins will be forgiven. But why? Why would we do that? We look at Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. It tells us that he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. That's the Bible. Plain and simple. You can't argue with that. There are many other verses as well. It's done by immersion because it comes from the Greek word meaning baptizo, which literally means to dip, to immerse, or to plunge. In addition to the literal meaning of the word, immersion is practiced because it was the practice of the church in apostolic times. Still, therefore, immersion is the only, um, immersion is the only thing that conforms to the description as given by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5, where it speaks of a burial and resurrection. And if we look at Matthew chapter 3 and verse 16, we find that it says, And when Jesus was baptized, he went up, he went up immediately from the water. Now, if he come up from the water, wouldn't he have to be below the water first? That would have to be immersion, wouldn't it? Also, and it says that, And Jesus was baptized. 
if we're Christians, we're going to go, we're going to follow Jesus and we're going to go where Jesus went. And Jesus was baptized by immersion. The question tonight is, are you willing to serve God all the days of your life by making him your heart's desire? In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 22, it says, And you shall be hated by all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. You know, you might be a good person, but good people are not going to heaven. Saved people are. You know, you can be a good swimmer, but is that going to be enough to save you if you are stranded in the middle of the ocean? If you have any need tonight, please come forward as we stand and sing. Who will follow Jesus standing for the right? Holding up his banner in the thickest fight. Listing for his orders, ready to obey. Who will follow Jesus, serving him today? Who will follow Jesus, who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side, Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus, who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side, Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus in life's busy ways? Working for the Master, giving Him the praise. Earnest in His vineyard, honoring His laws. Faithful to His counsel, watchful for His cause. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side. Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side. Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus in his work of love? Leading others to him, lifting prayers above. Courage, faithful servant, in his word we see. On our side forever will the Savior be. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side. Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side. Master, here am I.